In today's video, we're talking about prostate cancer that has metastasized to the bones. Now, while this is a serious situation, because of modern technology between the imaging and the treatments, we've seen thousands of patients go into remission, even being diagnosed with bone metastases. Now today, Dr. Mark Scholz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist focusing on solely in prostate cancer, is gonna discuss treatment options for bone meds. However, we did talk about spot radiation in a previous video, and I will link that in the description below. It's a great video, I'd encourage you to watch it. Dr. Scholz, today we're talking about prostate cancer that has metastasized to the bones. Now, in a previous video, we covered spot radiation quite extensively, and we'll link that video in the description below. And, but today we're talking about other forms of treatment, but there are a couple of things that we talked about in the previous video I'd like to reiterate here, just to make sure that somebody who's watching this as a standalone has the context. So when we talk about prostate cancer metastasizing to the bones, how does that happen? Prostate cancer starts in the prostate, and fortunately not all cancers metastasize, but uh, when they do, what is going on is a small um, component of the tumor, a few cells break free from the tumor, get into the bloodstream, float around the body, and land in uh, favorable soil. Prostate cancer doesn't grow easily in many parts of the body, and for most prostate cancers, it won't grow anywhere in the body. But more worrisome types, can metastasize and land in places like the lymph nodes, the bones, less frequently lungs or liver, and then uh, put down roots, start growing and multiplying, and then uh, they also can throw off additional cells that can jump to other spots. And at a certain point, when these cells become uh, tumors big enough, they can impair the function of the organ they're in. The bone marrow itself uh, can uh, have difficulty functioning in a normal fashion, and uh, that's when people start to get sick or have pain, which can lead to uh, um, a patient's demise. One of the things I would like to um bring some awareness to is when patients are diagnosed with metastatic cancer, especially to the bones, you know, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, and they tend to think, well, this, you know, they're told this is stage four, it's already metastasized, and in some cases are even given, you know, here's how many months or here's how many years you have to live, and in those cases with prostate cancer being so different, they're that timeline from just listening to you and so many of our speakers here at PCRI just seems like such a final thing to give a patient when there's so many treatments here in 2024. So can you talk about patients and case studies that you have seen gone into remission, you know, from going from bone mets to total remission for years, because you have many patients who have been in that situation. How the future is going to play out in the prostate cancer realm is going to be mostly dependent on the response to the treatment. A person can have extensive disease, but if they have a type of cancer that biologically is very sensitive to treatment and dies off very easily with treatment, that patient's gonna do better than a person who starts off with maybe only a couple of spots, but when you go after it with treatment, you seem to be unable to eradicate it. And so that's logical. If the disease can be controlled, it matters less how advanced it is than how susceptible it is to your available treatments. And in the prostate cancer world, we can estimate or determine how sensitive a uh, disease is to treatment by how quickly and how completely the, the, um, the cancer disappears under the influence of treatment. The technical term for that is the PSA nadir. If the PSA drops down to less than 0.1 within, say, six, seven months of starting treatment, that patient has a very Great. Uh, we did a study 20 years ago with just Lupron, and if patients were able to get their PSA less than 0.1, they, that group of patients in that long past era had an 85% 10-year survival. Don't listen too carefully to experts who are talking about your future if the treatment hasn't been implemented and if you haven't seen how it's going to respond to treatment because people can have a very dire situation and can do extremely well if their particular type of prostate cancer is susceptible to treatment. As a reminder, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it's telling the YouTube algorithm that this video was helpful for you, and it will push our videos out to other people who are searching for prostate cancer answers. Also, if you would like to donate and join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. 
you know, we have different options when it comes to bone meds. So can you speak, since we already covered spot radiation, can you speak to some of the other options and then we can break down the individual ones? When I think of treating men with bone meds, I think we want to think of two broad but separate categories. And uh, there's a scenario where maybe men have been checking their PSA, they show up in the emergency room, they've got some pain on their bones, and uh, a savvy emergency room doctor draws a PSA and finds out that the PSA is 800. And then they discover with scanning that there's spots of prostate cancer here and there. So that's one category of patients. The other perhaps more common category, because most men are being screened, is you know, going for their annual physical, have a PSA of five, get a prostate biopsy, they're diagnosed with Gleason 8, they go through treatment, they go into remission, and then three, four years later, their PSA is rising, and then they may get some further treatment, and then after a number of years further, there's some spot on the, spots on the bones. So the latter situation is usually something that it's taken a long time to develop, and may warrant a somewhat less aggressive treatment approach. Whereas the former situation, where someone has a cancer that's jumping outside the prostate early on and shows this more florid spread, uh, may be benefited by a combination or aggressive approach to try and make sure you kill as much cancer as possible. What do I mean by a combination? Well, everyone's going to get both first and second generation hormone therapy. They may get some sort of uh, spot radiation if they have less than five, um, five metastatic sites. Uh, but in addition to all that, some form of uh, chemotherapy like Taxotere would be a logical consideration as well. And this has been shown in prospective trials to, to prolong life in the people who just do first and second generation hormone therapy with or without radiation, and do first and second generation hormone therapy with or without radiation plus Taxotere. And the group that got the Taxotere in men that had bone meds at the time of diagnosis lived longer. If you think about how Taxotere as a systemic chemotherapy has been used historically with prostate cancer, it's sort of been a last ditch effort. So people have their radiation to try and be cured, the cancer comes back, they go on hormone therapy for 10 or more years, the cancer comes back, and then at that point, someone starts talking about, well, maybe we have to give you chemotherapy as a last ditch effort. Uh, this, um, so you can see these different roles for chemotherapy. In some cases where men have metastatic disease, it's postponed as long as possible. In other men, it's given as an upfront ancillary uh, method to enhance survival. When you're talking about, you know, patients who have had metastatic lesions, one of the questions that I get is if I have oligometastatic disease that's less than five, I get spot radiation, do I have to do the hormone therapy? Is that an automatic that any patient who has metastatic disease to the bones has to get hormone therapy? There's no hard and fast rule. The, the sort of methodology I use when I'm looking at a situation like this is in people that have metastatic disease, are we in a situation where they've had a lot of hormone therapy previously, they've been in a remission, they take a holiday, which is a component of intermittent therapy, the PSA starts to come up, the testosterone comes back, and now a new spot shows up. In that particular individual, I might be tempted to just radiate the metastatic site and see if the PSA goes back to zero before putting them back on hormone treatment. In people that have metastatic disease and have never been exposed to hormone therapy, the attraction of giving hormone therapy in addition to the radiation is quite great because the hope is that if there's other microscopic spots that have been missed on the scans, maybe you can eliminate them with systemic therapy, hormone therapy plus minus even chemotherapy. So to my understanding, hormone therapy is a systemic treatment that goes through the blood and is looking for those microscopic you know, spots. Does, it, does a patient have to be on it for you know, the normal 18 to 24 months if they are a metastatic patient and it's in the bones? Is that like an automatic time frame, Or is there a shorter course that they can look at because we now have PSMA? Well, the reason you're asking, of course, is because the longer the hormone treatment is continued, the more the side effects and, um, and the slower the recovery as well. Goals of giving these medicines are to induce longer remissions and, and maybe even a subgroup of people cure people. When we're looking at curing people, we tend to look at the studies where uh, cures are being attempted in newly diagnosed men. So with high-risk disease, historically, before we had PSMA PET scans, 
someone with a Gleason 8 cancer that's thought to be localized inside the prostate, scan, the old-fashioned CAT scans and everything were clear, uh, we knew that there could be micrometastatic disease. And so very careful studies were done to try and determine what was the point of diminishing returns for giving ancillary hormone treatment to the radiation or surgery. The number that was arrived at is somewhere between 12 to 18 months. If treatment is continued for a longer time beyond 12 to 18 months, the cure rates did not improve any further. So that's sort of the maximum. And then when we talk about reducing the time period, say, to six months rather than 12 to 18 months, uh, the, the sorts of things that one would be considering are the age of the patient, how well they're tolerating the treatment, how hopeful are we that a cure could be achieved. A formula is not really black and white. I, th I think the starting point in people that are trying to get maximum horsepower against the cancer is a 12 to 18 month continuation of both first and second generation hormone therapy. So how does the treatment like Extreva play into bone mets and prostate cancer? Amgen has developed a medicine that appears to inhibit cancer growth in the bones and is FDA approved for administration in people in prostate cancer and other cancers with proven bone metastasis. The medicine can be associated with some serious side effects in terms of the way um, our jaws function and people can develop wounds in their gums from this medicine when it's used in excessively high doses. Studies that led to uh, validation of the anti or the inhibitory effect on the cancer uh, looked at people who had no bone metastasis and who were either given exgeva or a placebo. And over time, these are people that had rising PSAs, they measured the time to the development of bone metastasis. And they showed that there was about a 20% delay in the time to bone metastasis in people getting exgeva compared to placebo. So it does have an inhibitory effect on the growth of bone metastasis. In our practice, we've sort of compromised because the package insert says to get a shot of Exgeva every month, and we, we've seen excessive frequency of, uh, of jaw necrosis problems, and typically we use the medicine in a reduced dose, perhaps every three to six months. For people who have a lot of metastatic disease, and we have this first line of defense, you know, first and second generation hormone therapy, but then in, they're in that situation where maybe it is not being as effective and it's not working, what are the next options that they have? Well, the way we usually sequence uh, these different systemic therapies like Provenge, Zofigo, chemotherapy, Pluvicto, is to first try and sneak some immune therapy in uh, called Provenge. The evidence is that the Provenge is more effective at the earliest stage. Ideally, I'd like to see people get Provenge even before they become hormone resistant, but it's an expensive treatment and insurance only covers it at that uh, inception point of hormone resistance. So uh, it's an easy treatment. You get it three injections over six weeks. It usually doesn't have any side effects and it's clearly been associated with prolonged survival. So I would, for those patients that have insurance coverage, not want them to miss out on getting some Provenge. And so the idea is to use it at the earliest possible juncture. After Provenge is administered, do you wait around and see you know, how it works? Does it affect PSA? And can you see like a reduction of tumors on imaging? People should think of Provenge sort of like a vaccine. So we don't really know how it works. The reason that we believe that some vaccines work, maybe others don't, is that studies were done in large groups of people and vaccinated people do better than unvaccinated people. And that's the way the Provenge studies were done. So I don't wait around. If someone is uh, in a situation where they qualify for Provenge, they have a potentially life-threatening disease. It's not gonna be paid for if they don't have hormone resistance and a rising PSA. Soon after the Provenge, Within weeks or a couple months, we're talking about, well, what's the next thing to do to ensure that we are bringing to bear all the different resources that we have to control the cancer? And uh, we've mentioned some of them. The logical considerations are things like Taxotere, Pluvicto, um, Zofigo. I'd say the most natural sequence, again, for insurance reasons, is to think about some sort of Taxotere because insurance won't cover Pluvicto, which in my view has uh, equal efficacy to Taxotere but less side effects unless someone's already had Taxotere. Most insurances say you have to have some exposure to Taxotere. To 
give uh, patients at least a little bit of taxotera to make them eligible to get insurance coverage for Plavicto is a, is a very logical next step. The fact that Plavicto has less side effects than taxotera I think is pretty indisputable. These, uh, this medicine uh, is an injectable form of radiation given every six weeks. The most common side effect is, uh, is a dry mouth. Uh, you can have some mild GI symptoms, maybe some fatigue after, for a week or two after the injection. But compared to Taxotere, it is um, a, a less onerous undertaking in terms of side effects. Taxotere has uh, been around since, you know, for 20 years and is a proven anti-cancer uh, treatment. But it does have very severe cyclical fatigue, hair loss, and efficacy, when it's stopped, usually it dissipates quickly. So you have to stay on the taxitary if you're responding to continue to get a response afterwards. So when we're talking about the sequencing, you know, we've talked about hormone therapy, we've talked about Provenge, we've talked about taxitary, and Pluvicto, where do you see Zofigo playing in? Do you normally give Zofigo before Pluvicto would come up, or do you see Pluvicto being more effective early on? I think Pluvicto's taken over the, um, the Zofigo in terms of sequencing. The anti-cancer efficacy seems to be more notable. It's typical to see substantial PSA declines with Pluvicto, whereas that's not common with Zofigo. Pluvicto can go to the liver, it can go to the lymph nodes, whereas Zofigo exclusively will treat bone metastasis. So the role for Zofigo in our practice is more sort of a last ditch effort if people have had their taxotere, they've had their Pluvicto, uh, they've had their Provenge, and the disease is still unfortunately not controlled and they don't have access to any additional taxotere just because it wasn't working uh, or additional Pluvicto because it wasn't working. Then I think that's a very natural role for Zofigo. In the original studies showing that Zofigo can prolong life, the people that were studied had very advanced disease. This was done over in Europe, had very high PSA levels, had a lot of metastatic disease, and they were able to demonstrate that Zofigo could make the patients who received Zofigo would live longer than those that didn't. So it has efficacy in particular against really serious cancers. When we talk about these types of treatments, you know, when a patient is on hormone therapy and they've been on it for quite some time, or maybe they had surgery or radiation, maybe their cancer was controlled for a certain amount of time. But when it comes to these bone meds and when it comes to treating them, I oftentimes see that doctors are maybe not getting the PSA checked as often or acting if the PSA is rising fast enough. And this happens a lot in community settings and I think it's really important for patients to get their own PSA tests and ask those doctors and advocate for themselves because from, from my perspective, this is really a time sensitive issue. So can you give us some more in-depth discussion on the timing of these drugs and how long should they wait? And if they see these numbers rise, what's the, you know how quickly should we be getting to the next step? The general rule of thumb, for example, if someone is starting off on chemotherapy or Pluvicto, is to check the PSA monthly and after two treatments have been given, we should see if the PSA was previously rising, at least some stabilization, some sort of anti-cancer uh, effect is, should be reflected relatively early on in the PSA checking. Two cycles of taxotere, for example, you should at least see a previously rising PSA stop rising. If it's continuing to rise after two cycles, it, so that's a suggestion that the tax here isn't working in that individual. And that's a strong indication that it's time to walk away from the tax here. We don't like to do that, but it's not working. So we have to go on to something else. Putting people on autopilot and just, you're gonna get six cycles of tax you're gonna get six cycles of Pluvicto, uh, is very short-sighted. And patients can be simply getting side effects by having ongoing treatment without any benefit if the PSA isn't dropping. A common question I get specifically from caregivers is they're concerned about the stamina of what it takes for a patient to go through all these different types of treatments with all the different side effects in combination. So being in your practice, do you see that patients are able to tolerate these pretty well? Like how do you handle the ins and outs of those types of things? Well, one thing, just as we do with hormone treatment, we counsel patients adamantly that they have to stay in some sort of a fitness program. It's quite challenging as all these treatments can cause fatigue. Hormone treatment can cause fatigue, chemotherapy can cause fatigue. 
And the only thing we found that combats that consistently is fitness. That is the, the bedrock foundation of how to successfully endure these types of treatments. The other thing that is not often realized is that there are different schedules. Taxotere is usually given at a dose of 70 milligrams every three weeks. It doesn't have to be done that way. You can give 20 to 25 milligrams weekly. It's less convenient, but it is better tolerated. Patients also, in terms of other supportive things to consider, uh, sometimes are not administered prophylactic uh, nupogen or nulasta, which build up the immune system so that patients don't get infections. Surprisingly, there are still centers that are waiting for an infection to occur before they use these prophylactic medications. And I don't understand that considering that insurance typically will cover this sort of, uh, this sort of therapy. I think one of the most important things a metastatic prostate cancer patient can do is to seek multiple opinions, especially if you've been given a timeline for how long you're going to live, without treatment options being discussed or administered. You never know how that treatment is going to affect that cancer. Every prostate cancer patient is different. And as, you heard, as you've heard Dr. Schulz say, many, many patients who have bone metastases, he has seen them have durable remissions. An important talk for any advanced prostate cancer patient is done by Eugene Kwan from Mayo Clinic at our previous conference, and I'm going to link that in the description below. He basically built a combat manual that discusses the ins and outs of treatments for advanced prostate cancer and the combination of them, and it's a crucial talk for any patient in this category. Now, if you need help with your personal case, I would contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. They are patients who have been through prostate cancer treatments and they've been trained by our medical oncology team. They give you information, not advice, but the best thing that they can do is help give you questions for your medical team so that you can have better outcomes. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Please remember you're not alone and I hope you have a great week.